Psychedelic drugs like MDNA and magic mushrooms are being looked at to help treat mental illness, addiction, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr Stephen Bright, Senior Lecturer of Addiction, Edith Cohen University, has all the information. Welcome, Dr Stephen. Thanks for having me, Shelley. So what does the research say, MDMA, ecstasy, how does it help? Well, there's been quite a bit of research internationally looking at MDMA in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's been six phase two clinical trials and that's allowed the sponsor of the trials to get approval from the FDA to commence phase three clinical trials. And the first of those phase three clinical trials has just been completed, but the other phase three trials are still underway. And the research that they've conducted so far is very promising. It shows that people who have treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder, so they haven't responded to conventional treatments, upwards of two-thirds are cured of PTSD after this treatment. What do you say to people who are now saying, oh, that's MDMA, it's a bad drug, we shouldn't use it? What would you say to those people? (laughs) Well, I think the first thing is that there's a big difference between pharmaceutical MDMA used in a clinical environment with two psychotherapists and a psychiatrist overseeing the patient compared to somebody, you know, taking ecstasy at a festival. And it's not just the context, it's the intention of the patient and it's the way in which the psychotherapists hold the space while that work takes place. Having undergone the training for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, myself to um, engage in some research here in Perth using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, Uh, what surprised me the most was that people were not having a good time while they were undergoing this treatment. They were not in ecstasy at all. In fact, they were in agony. They were re-experiencing the trauma, often trauma that they'd been unable to speak about previously because the way MDMA works is it dampens down the amygdala, the part of the brain that controls fear, and it also uh, activates parts of the prefrontal cortex associated with language. So it allows people to reprocess memories in which they appreciate previously been unable to talk about or have just been, you know, too difficult, too painful to even think about. And when they're experiencing the trauma with the MDMA, what is the end result and how does somebody feel good afterwards? Is there follow-up? Absolutely. This is another really important part of the therapy. It's not just giving people a drug. It involves up to 18 sessions of psychotherapy and only three of those involve the actual drug. So there's preparatory sessions in which uh, we work with the patient to help them understand what the experience is going to be like, determine what their intention is, explain how they work through some of those challenging experiences they might experience during the MDMA session. And then just as important or perhaps more important is the integration that takes place the next day where we work to integrate the experience and help them understand that and apply that experience into their everyday life. And then we have another few sessions of integration with them for a few weeks afterwards uh, before sort of rinsing and repeating. So what are the results the patient's looking for and and what is the outcome, do you think? The result patients are looking for is is a cure for PTSD. So at the moment, the gold standard treatment is exposure-based cognitive behavioural therapy. And for those patients that it works on, it works well. Mm. But there are a number of patients that don't respond to cognitive behavioural therapy. And in turn, they're often put on antidepressant medications, which at best are just mitigating the symptoms. They're not providing a cure and so participants that are accessing these treatments through the research that's occurring around the world are, are really looking for a cure to their PTSD because it is a really debilitating condition often yeah. people are unable to work they're not able to maintain steady intimate relationships and so um, you know when we look at our ADF for example more Australian soldiers have died as a result of suicide um, in the mm. past 10 or 20 years than have died in combat overseas and that suicide has usually been precipitated by symptoms of PTSD. Wow and in your experience is PTSD resolved or cured through this method if they in fact respond well? 
Yeah, to the point where at three and a half years follow-up, they still have no symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So it is very effective for people who have not responded to other treatments. And I think that's a really important point to make is that the research that's being done at the moment, including the, the research get underway here in Perth very soon is only looking at people that have not responded to conventional treatments. So we're not suggesting that this would be a first line treatment, even if it were rolled out as a medicine in the future, should the TGA decide that MDMA is able to be used as a medicine in the future. Um, let's go to magic mushrooms. What's the component in magic mushrooms that is helpful for the treatment of mental illnesses? So the, the active component is psilocybin and in the clinical trials it's actually psilocybin that's used, not mushrooms themselves because you know mushrooms are, as an organic product, it's difficult to measure out an accurate dose using mushrooms. So a synthetic version of psilocybin is provided and there's been a range of conditions for which this is being investigated. The one which has the most research and at the moment phase three trials are currently under the way is for treatment refractory depression, so depression that hasn't responded to existing treatments, but there's also really promising preliminary data showing that psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy may be effective in treating obsessive-compulsive disorder in addition to uh, substance use disorders. So they've looked at it as a very effective tool for tobacco cessation and also alcohol use disorder. And there's research underway at the moment looking at um, cocaine use disorder, which might be potentially applicable to methamphetamine. Does it work in the same way for depression and addiction as MDMA does for PTSD? No, it's quite different. In fact, we don't really know the mechanism for which psilocybin acts as a treatment. So in the past, we thought that psychedelic drugs uh, turned on parts of the brain, but it seems what it does is it actually turns off part of the brain called the default mode network. And the default mode network is a bit like the conductor of the brain. It makes sure, uh, without a default mode network, you and I wouldn't be able to have this conversation at the moment. We wouldn't be able to attend. Uh, we wouldn't be able to think about ourselves. And so by turning off the brain's conductor, it may be that the cacophony of noise and um, different pathways that start connecting within the brain lead to epiphanies. And it's hypothesized that these epiphanies people have while under the influence of psilocybin uh, allow them to see themselves, uh, others and the world in a completely new perspective. And, and essentially that's what our current psychotherapies aim to do. But what psilocybin does in one session might take somebody 18 or 24 weeks of psychotherapy to do. So it seems to, to, to act much quicker in allowing people to have these epiphanies. Now let's talk about the different schedule of drugs so people understand where these drugs sit. So there's Schedule 8 drugs and Schedule 9 drugs. What are some of those drugs? So Schedule 9 drugs are the prohibited drugs that we're most familiar with as illegal drugs. So MDMA and psilocybin at the moment are both Schedule 9 drugs, as are things like heroin, the drugs we, we consider illegal drugs, whereas Schedule 8 medicines are controlled medicines. And so some examples of these would be dexamphetamine used for the treatment of ADHD, morphine used in hospitals, fentanyl used in hospitals, and even drugs like ketamine, uh, which do have, you know, are used sometimes recreationally but is also used in hospitals, particularly in paediatrics, as an analgesic and also as an anaesthetic. So the key difference is that Schedule 9 drugs are prohibited and cannot be prescribed in medicine. However, we are lucky in Australia in that we can use Schedule 9 drugs in the context of research, and, and that's how the research in Australia has been able to move forward. However, it's difficult for doctors to prescribe them. There is an access pathway called the SASB, a special access system within the TGA, though it's, it's very cumbersome, and I'm not aware of anybody that's been able to prescribe these drugs using that special access scheme, whereas uh, Schedule 8 drugs 
are able to be prescribed with controls in place. So, for example, with things like morphine and, uh, and dexamphetamine, they have to be stored in a special safe. And there's a lot more controls over who's able to access those drugs, how that's documented. And so there's those additional controls that are in place for Schedule 8 substances. I'm Shelley Ware on ABC Radio, and I'm talking to Dr. Stephen Bright, Senior Lecturer of Addiction at Edith Cohen University. Now, the Therapeutic Administration evaluates proposals around the provision of medical treatment in Australia. They've considered one at the moment that I believe you've put forward um, with MDMA. Tell us about that application. So an application was made by another organisation, actually. Okay. I think, in my opinion, the application was made too early because, as I mentioned earlier, these phase three clinical trials haven't been completed overseas and it's premature to ask the TGA to approve a drug as a medicine when the research hasn't been completed. So I think that application was put in prematurely and so I wasn't particularly surprised when the TGA announced their interim decision a couple of days ago that they weren't going to make any changes to the scheduling. However, I did read the TGA as, as quite positive. They said, you know, this is something they could see happening into the future, but we need to do more research to get to that point. And so one of the organisations I'm involved in that made a submission to the TGA um, during this process is PRISM, or Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine. And I guess our key points to the TGA were that for this to be rolled out, this isn't like medical cannabis. You're not just giving a patient a takeaway dose. It needs to be integrated within our public health care system. And all the research we're doing at the moment is in collaboration with hospitals to try to set up the infrastructure so that this is something that patients would be able to access outside of the context of research. We also need to set up the clinical governance to ensure that the people providing the treatment have been appropriately trained. And to do that, we need to engage with the key stakeholders like the Australian Medical Association and the Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatry to develop accredited training programs to ensure the safety of patients that are undergoing this therapy. Therapy. And I think for, for me, a key message from all of this is, while the TGA has said that this may happen in the future, and, and my perspective on what has happened is that this is not a setback, but rather an opportunity for us to move forward, all of the research that's happening in Australia at the moment is not being funded by government. It's being funded by philanthropic sources and uh, other funding bodies or uh, industry even, uh, the cannabis industries uh, funding a, a recent study proposed at Monash University. And so I think for us to scale up some of the research that we're doing to a level that would give the TGA confidence that we have the people and infrastructure to be able to deliver these therapies safely in Australia as medicines. It's really important that the government funds some of the research that we're doing so we're able to scale up. So you weren't surprised, so you're thinking Australia's not quite ready. What are some of the main reasons? You touched on one with no accredited training. What are some other reasons we're not ready? Well, along with the accredited training would be a registry system. So at the moment, I'm a clinically trained psychologist and I'm an approved supervisor and all that is listed on the APRA, the Australian Health Professionals Registration Body. It's the same body that registers medical doctors, psychiatrists, dentists. So I think they're a key stakeholder here as well. They need to come to the party and ensure that this training becomes part of an endorsement that's registered on the registration body site so that, um, that we're able to track who is accredited to provide this training and who's not so that we ensure the safety of patients. In addition to that, I think there needs to be clinical guidelines developed around how the treatments are provided and to whom they are provided and to whom they are not provided because the research at the moment, because it is in fairly early stages, is excluding a lot of patients for which we think might be risky. So people with uh, a history of psychosis or a psychotic disorder, people with bipolar disorder, certain personality disorders and a number of medical conditions or, or people with 
any of these things are being excluded at the moment from the research. And so before it's able to be rolled out as a conventional treatment in Australia, the National Health and Medical Research Council needs to develop clinical guidelines around how we provide this therapy and to whom it should and shouldn't be provided in a similar way that they have done with medical cannabis. So how far away, in your opinion, is the rollout, and more importantly, the acceptance of this method to roll it out and be a way forward to curing mental illnesses? I would say anywhere between three and five years. I think Australia is moving very quickly in terms of demonstrating our capacity to deliver these therapies safely and effectively through the research that we're doing. And that research is, is ramping up. We're seeing more and more studies being approved in Australia. So I think we need those studies to at least be at first completed. In addition to that, the research occurring overseas, the phase three clinical trials need to be completed. And it's like Likely that with MDMA, it'll probably be the first one where that all the phase three trials are completed, and it may be an FDA-approved medication by, say, 2024. So as soon as it's an FDA-approved medication, I think we would be in a very different position then in Australia in terms of requesting the TGA to look at this again. Again, it goes back to my point of the application being made a little prematurely. Had a, had the TGA decided to reschedule these drugs from Schedule Nine? to Schedule 8 and, and make them controlled medicines, Australia would have been the first country in the world to do that. And I, I just like to think Australia is innovative and we, we are you know, ahead of the game, but I don't think we're going to be the first country in the world to approve MDMA and, and magic mushrooms as treatments for mental health issues. I know that rollout really, it's not that far off. Has there been any pushback at all like from groups that don't agree with this method? I think, look, I've been in this game now for about 10 years working on getting research up in Australia um, through my role with PRISM and working with the different bodies like the AMA and the Royal Australian College of uh, Psychiatry and they've really come on board in terms of us sort of being on the same message at the moment. We all agree more research needs to be conducted so I think Things have certainly changed a lot in 10 years in Australia where the key peak medical bodies are saying the same thing that we're saying. We need to do more research. And so I think that where there was, was some sort of initial pushback sort of five or ten years ago, there's not that pushback now. And I think provided the research is done and provided that we engage with those key medical peak bodies to collaborate develop the training, collaborate, develop the guidelines, then I think this is something that's realistically possible within the next three to five years. Good luck with everything, Dr Stephen. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Shelley. That was Dr Stephen Bright, Senior Lecturer of Addiction of Edith Cohen University. I'm Shelley Ware and you are listening to ABC Radio.